On behalf of the University of California, thank you for tuning in today for our Alumni Career Network webinar. My name is Ethan Bertrand, and I'm a proud UC Santa Barbara alum from the class of 2022. I work as a community leader and local government professional in Santa Barbara County. I'm honored to be moderating today's webinar. This program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with the information, insights, and connections necessary to launch, grow, or expand your career. Throughout today's session, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speakers by clicking the Q&A button on your screen. We will try and answer as many questions as possible during the event. Our discussion today is focused on navigating ageism as a young professional. Our panel will share personal experiences and insights, along with tangible tips and advice to help you gain a greater understanding of generational differences in work style, leadership, and supervision. When I first found out the topic of today's panel, um, I was really moved by it. Um, I've served in public office, elected office, uh, since the age of 19. Uh, seven years later at 26, I'm still often the youngest person um, in the room for a lot of my work. Um, and with that, I really care about how we can make all workspaces and all professions more inclusive for young people. At the same time, I've also been able to be in touch with older relatives and friends who are experiencing ageism at the other end of the spectrum. I'll also mention that when I think of ageism, I'm especially interested in how it intersects with other structural inequities in the workplace and the community, including racism, ableism, classism, and other issues, um, sexism as well. So I'm really excited for our discussion today. I'm joined by four inspiring UC alumni. Jessica Gassiorek, PhD, is Associate Professor in the Communicology Program in the School of Communication and Information at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Jessica's research examines how social identities, like age, affect communication, how people process messages, and how people create understanding. Jessica also studies intergenerational communication and how communication affects people's ideas about age and aging. Jessica has published over 50 articles and book chapters, as well as two recent books on these topics. Jessica has also served as chair of National Communication Association's Communication and Aging Division. And she is currently president of the International Association of Language and Social Psychology. Jessica is a graduate of UC Santa Barbara in 2013. Go Gauchos and welcome Jessica. Next up, we are joined by Francesca Palermino, Senior Undergraduate Advisor at UC Santa Barbara. Francesca is a 2017 alumna of UCSB with a bachelor's degree in communication and a minor in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Francesca has worked as programs assistant with academic success initiatives at the Transfer and ONDAS student centers to support the needs of transfer and first-gen college students. In 2019, Francesca became the senior undergraduate advisor for the communications department. Throughout her UCSB career, she also co-founded the Young Professionals Network and has served on various campus committees and initiatives, such as the UCSB Supergroup, the Green Dot Bystander Intervention Team, Education 118 Teaching Team, and others. Welcome, Francesca. Next up, we are pleased to be joined by Michael Villalobos, Doctor of Education. Michael is Interim Associate Vice Chancellor of the Office of Campus Community Relations and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at UC Davis. Michael leads important and long-standing campus-wide climate and inclusion initiatives, namely the UC Davis's Diversity and Equity Education and Training Program and the Campus Community Book Project. These two diversity and inclusion hallmark programs are recognized across the UC system for their robustness and scope. 
reaching faculty, students, and staff at both ends of the causeway and extending to the communities beyond UC Davis and UC Davis Health. Michael also has oversight responsibilities of the UC Davis Police Accountability Board, another model program system-wide and nationally. Among other campus-wide inclusion initiatives that Michael has led are the implementation of the Preferred Names Project and the institutionalization of the anti-bullying training program. Michael has his Bachelor of Arts and Doctorate of Education from UC Davis. And last but certainly not least, Evie Rangel, Director of Human Resources and Operations at the Santa Barbara Foundation. Evie's complex intersectional identity and unconventional professional background have informed her curiosity as a human and business person. Graduating with honors in classical music from UC San Diego in 2007, later followed by professional studies at UCSB, ultimately led to a senior certified professional credential through the Society for Human Resources Management. As a strategic HR leader, Evie prioritizes awareness around intersectionality as the evolution of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access work and is driven by her professional values of humor, emotional intelligence, and trust. Jessica, Francesca, Michael, Evie, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, I know we're gonna have a great conversation. And without further ado, let's jump in. Um, so our first question is uh, just to start off, please give us a quick introduction about your role and why this topic is important to you. And we'll start off with Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you for introducing us all and getting us started. Um, for me, myself, I actually got into the topic of ageism um, kind of through my research as a PhD student. Um, I was also a relatively young PhD student, um, and so was kind of navigating both graduate school and then my early career years as somebody who looked relatively young and was relatively young in these like professional spaces filled with a lot of people who are much older than me. Um, but what really interested me about ageism and about intergenerational interactions more generally is this idea that we are all going to be all of the ages, right? Like there are different kinds of discrimination that happen where people are from different ethnic or racial groups or different genders or things like that. And those like we go through all of our life as a member of like one of those groups, but not all of the groups. Um, and age is different, right? Like age is dynamic. Like we're, we're young and then we're middle-aged and we're older, but like all of us are gonna be all of those things. Um, and so it was really interesting, like ageism as an idea is really interesting to me because it's this discrimination either like when you're older of your past self as if it's directed at younger adults or like when younger people are, you know, exhibiting ageism towards older people, it's like, that's your future. Um, and so it's, it was just really interesting to me that we seem to do this thing um, you know, discriminating against people of different ages or treating people of different ages differently, despite the fact that like we've either all been there or we're all going to be there. So I found that just really interesting. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, next up, Francesca, tell us about your role and uh, why this topic is important to you. Yeah, so I am currently a staff member on campus at UC Santa Barbara, and I transitioned directly from um, undergrad graduating from my program directly into a staff role. So that was a really kind of rough transition for me. Um, you know, navigating myself through the campus and kind of seeing it through a new lens as a staff member um, versus what I had previously seen the campus from the student perspective. And being perceived still as a student um, was definitely like one of the biggest challenges in transitioning. And that's kind of what's what's interesting about this role. Um, or being a staff member on campus, on any UC campus, um, that transition directly from undergrad. Um, and I found kind of it isolating being one of the youngest people in my office. Um, and in a lot of departments on campus, what I didn't realize is there was a lot of recent grads transitioning into staff roles feeling the same way. So there was a feeling of isolation, but also solidarity once we started finding each other. Um, and that's kind of how we developed the Young Professionals Network at UC Santa Barbara, and that's kind of where that started. Great, thank you. Uh, how about you, Michael? Hello, everyone. 
I'm currently serving as Interim Associate Vice Chancellor um, at UC Davis in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I come to this work really by, um, by accident, I would say, as a diversity educator, I've never met anyone who said that when I grow up, I'd like to be a diversity educator. And so my experience really that informed my um, career path um, was in participating in uh, workshops and trainings that really explore um, experiences, in particular, of those who have been historically marginalized. I'm a first generation student. I'm a person of color, a gay person, someone who has a hidden disability. And certainly when I think about my experience across the years that I've spent um, within the institution, both having been um, a product of, of UC Davis and also staff, um, I really became interested in how we explore the opportunities and really thinking about personal experiences as people experience it at the institutional level and how we may compel practices and policies that would, for example, um, equate to more inclusive and equitable practice. So that translated to really spearheading um, what was then diversity education program. So an opportunity really to build awareness and understanding and knowledge that will then inform how we navigate the complexity of diverse communities, in particular what it means for the University of California as a public institution to really play a role in how we would make really meaningful dents in changing the system that has been set up typically in terms of you know, dominant culture perspectives, right? And then we are um, having the opportunity to question and challenge in terms of how these systems are set up, again, with the goal of making um, the university uh, more accessible, uh, more just, and, and more equitable. Uh, so for me, the initial introduction really is how I felt as a student finding the voice in terms of what it means for me to navigate the institution. And then having spent 29 years as staff, all at UC Davis certainly has been an opportunity for me to really explore the different groups that, um, that felt that they have been uh, voiceless or they have not been represented. So that really translated uh, to my work in looking at how we create structures really that, uh, that would foster greater inclusion and greater equity. Great, thank you, Michael. And how about you, Evie? Tell us about your role and how uh, that connects to this topic. Thank you. Grateful to be here. Um, you've heard a bit about me, everyone. So I'll expand by saying I've been in the human resources field for just under eight years. I'm currently in HR leadership within my org. So a little bit about my role and how it functions. Um, within our organization, I function like a consultant to our executive team, aka the C-suite, as you'd call it in like for-profit. So my role oversees general business operations and the people side of what we do. Um, personally, um, significance on our topic today stems from my own experience with reverse ageism in many work settings across industries. Um, secondly, this topic is important to me as I have been very fortunate to be part of a myriad of unique learning experiences as a member of leadership, sort of a bridge between generations and understanding different modes of communication and values and how those affect what is um, reverse ageism and what can be perceived as reverse ageism. I know we have a lot to get through today, so I'm just going to end there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We're off to a strong start. Uh, next up, we're gonna ask, uh, what are some examples of generational differences in work style and how uh, can we see ageism play out in the workplace um, as a result of these differences? And we'll start with uh, Francesca. Yeah, so I would say that one of the biggest kind of abrupt things that I saw kind of coming into the like the staff role at UC Santa Barbara um, is I was confronted often with, well, that's just the way we do things because that's the way we've always done things. So I would say that's the number one thing that I've been confronted with um, when I've suggested things like, oh, let's use technology to make things a little bit easier, a little more efficient. Um, and then kind of being combated with that. Well, that's just the way we've always done things. So that's just something that um, I've kind of experienced quite a bit. Um, and I just think that that's a really common thing that young professionals will experience in the workplace is, um, you know, trying to advocate for your ideas, whether it has to do with technology or using um, a new system or something like that. Um, really just 
bringing new fresh ideas to the table and having to really self-advocate um, to, to explain to your team or supervisors uh, why you feel like your um, idea or solution is worthy or valid. Yeah, thank you for that. I really connect with uh, your answer and your experience there. Um, how about you, Evie? What are your thoughts on general, generational differences and uh, how they play out? Thank you. I did a lot of um, reflecting on this. And so I'm coming at it, of course, as an HR person, kind of bird's eye view. So when we talk about generational differences in work style, um, we're really talking about a difference in values and how those values can translate into dissimilar ways of working. An example would be how a person wants or needs to be thanked or rewarded in order to continue to perform satisfactorily or above in their job. Typically, um, in my experience, older generations, and most of my experience has been with baby boomers and Gen Xers, they often have a quote unquote, anything to get the job done mentality, pushing through sickness, stress, long hours, and not being asked or accustomed to verbal praise or otherwise, especially in group settings. Whereas millennials, on the other hand, have generally come up more of what they need to be successful, not just professionally, but personally as a whole person, wellness. Um, and often thrive or continue even stronger performance once rewarded on the spot, thanked in a group setting for their specific contributions, or given real time and space to take PTO or vacation after, you know, a grueling project to reset. So to an older colleague, the younger professional I just described may seem less motivated and therefore less mature or quote unquote professional, which isn't true. However, that's through their lens that has been created through their own unique life experience. And it's a reflection on values that come out as reverse ageism. Great, thank you so much. Uh, how about you, Jessica? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, what Evie just said actually echoed a lot of the points that, that I was gonna say. We didn't consult ahead of time, but, but really I do think that a lot of these things come down to generational differences in values, like Evie was saying. Um, and so it's this idea of like, what is considered good? What is considered sort of a, a positive thing? What's considered something that is valuable? Um, and I think um, kind of as Evie already mentioned for boomers, um, there's this notion of like, putting in your time, pushing through all the obstacles, all these kinds of things. And that's something that we're seeing younger generations just not subscribe to in the same way. Um, and I, I think it's very easy. And, and this is a pattern that we see like repeated over generations that whenever a new generation is coming up with a different set of values than sort of the dominant generation in a workplace, like whatever the new thing is, is kind of looked down upon because it's different. Um, and I think it's important for us to step back and recognize that like no set of values in this case is necessarily like inherently better or worse, but it's just that difference is what is jarring to people. Um, and that it can feel like a little bit of an identity thread if somebody is like pushing forward a set of values that feels different than your own. And so for boomers who have this attitude of like, we're gonna push through everything, like you have to put in your time, all of those kinds of things. Um, having a new generation come up with a different set of values and a different set of ideas, um, I think can sometimes be perceived as threatening to them. And that then gets expressed in, um, you know, sort of negative attitudes, whether like overt or more covert towards that kind of behavior. But I, I think it's really helpful to kind of step back and just recognize that at, at its, you know, most basic, we're just talking about differences in what generations feel like is important to them and like, what's the role of work in their life and those kinds of things. and. And we're seeing those differences play out in terms of, of judgments and attitudes towards each other. Totally, thank you for that. And how about you, Michael? So how I uh, see it within the context of my work uh, really is uh, far more, um, it's simpler in terms of how I would share it. I mean, it really uh, comes across in the way that we stereotypes stereotype across uh, generations. I mean, that's the most prominent way in, in uh, the way that we uh, see ageism um, or adultism play out um, in the workplace. Um, certainly you see and hear it in how we communicate, how we treat each other um, as informed by those very different values that's informed by whatever generation um, that we occupy. Um, there are certainly, uh, 
uh, behaviorally based uh, types of uh, examples that may um, that may be um, presented, uh, for example, in notions of work ethic and who has a better work ethic, right? And the standards that are in place, it certainly is shaped by the culture of the workplace. And especially if the workplace tends to have a majority of a particular group. And as far as um, how it plays out um, in practice and policies, I mean, it plays out in terms of who gets promoted, who gets an opportunity, to uh, to experience exciting projects, um, who gets listened to, um, who gets hired. Um, I think all of those things are really, really important to uh, explore because the stereotypes, and we may think that they are benign, certainly can leak into or leak out in terms of how we create practices and policies that may impact uh, different groups uh, di disparately. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll now get into some targeted questions um, specific to uh, panelists based on their experience. And uh, this first question uh, will be on research uh, for Jessica. What is the data saying about the experience of young professionals in the workplace? So I guess you can kind of take this in a few different directions. Um, I think first of all, just from kind of like a, a research perspective, it's helpful to kind of make explicit when we're talking about ageism, what we're talking about. Like we've all kind of gotten at it indirectly, but I think it's helpful to just be very explicit that like when we're talking about ageism, we're talking about a situation where someone is seeing you primarily in terms of your age, right? They're not seeing you as an individual. They're not seeing you as a unique person with a unique set of experiences. Like they're reacting to you and communicating with you and engaging with you primarily on the basis of your age and on the basis of related stereotypes, which Michael was just talking about, like kind of to make that link. Um, and so when we think about like what are situations where this plays out, really often it's places where we have some kinds of cues to age that are kind of front and center. Um, and so, you know, so people, it may be like, the way people are dressing, the suggestions that people are making, things like that, oftentimes those end up being, um, you know, sort of triggers to, to ageism or triggers to age identity being something that, that then people have at like the forefront of their mind um, and that then can, can impact the interaction. Um, looking at kind of prevalence of ageism and things like that, I do think that in popular conversation, oftentimes when people think about ageism in the workplace, like what pops to mind immediately for people is like, oh, older adults, like older adults are being discriminated in the workplace. That's like everyone's kind of go-to. Um, and the data would say like the research that's been out there that surveyed younger adults about experiences of ageism and things like that um, really um, kind of stands in contrast to that, which is that what we see in, in well, you know, when we ask younger adults about experiences of being treated differently on the basis of their age, like they experience a lot of ageism and in some cases more ageism sort of than, than older adults do or more things that they attribute to age. Um, Evie mentioned kind of perceptions of ageism versus, you know, actions of ageism or things like that. And so at least when you ask young adults about their perceptions, things that they would attribute to, you know, I'm being treated differently because of my age. Um, it's something that happens really frequently. Um, and this isn't just something that, you know, has been happening recently. Like we see it, you know, back back in data to the early 2000s um, and in large scale surveys, like things like the European social survey. So it's not just the United States, it's stuff we see, you know, in, in Europe too. Um, certainly that's, that's kind of documented there. Um, so I just, you know, I would say certainly to kind of like validate people's experiences, like it's not just you, like this is a real thing and it's definitely happening. Um, and, and we have sort of experience, you know, people's subjective experiential data to kind of back that up. The last thing I would say though, that the, the data um, or the research around this area also says um, is that we as, you know, particularly as younger adults looking at like, what do older adults think of us in the workplace? I think oftentimes, you know, it's the negative experiences that draw our attention the most, right? It's when things are problematic that we pay the most attention and those are the ones that kind of stick with us. Um, but when you ask people who are younger, like what do older adults think of you in the work, you know, especially in the workplace? And then you actually ask those older adults, like what do you think of younger people in the workplace? 
the older adults' actual perceptions of younger people are much more positive than younger adults think they are. Um, so I want to like certainly acknowledge again that like this is a very real experience of, of ageism, but at the same time that younger people may think that they are being perceived more negatively than they actually are. That's like my little note of optimism that we get out of the research is that the, the situation may not be as bad as you perceive it to be in the moment. Uh, when you actually ask older people, they have a lot of really positive things to say about younger generations coming up in the workplace because there's there are a lot of really fantastic things about about young people like in this kind of setting. And, and I think older adults do recognize that, but it's easier for us. And this is this is like a well-documented psychological thing to like focus on the negative rather than focusing on the positive. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jessica. That's fascinating research. And perhaps our participants will have some more questions on that later on. Uh, thanks for all of that. Next up, uh, we will go to Evie um, on intersectional experiences. Um, Evie, age is one part of all of our identities. Can you talk about how team members with multiple social identity experiences um, can uh, experience ageism differently in the workplace? And can you give any advice on how an HR team can best support young employees? Definitely. Thanks, Ethan. So um, you'll hear me use the term um, that Ethan first used, intersectional identity, um, which has a key difference from the other term that was in the question, social identities. And I just did another talk, and a lot of people um, weren't quite sure of the definition of intersectional identity. And so those two terms are very different. So I'm going to use the term intersectional identity when I answer this question. And that refers to the ways um, in which systems of inequality based on gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, class, and forms of other discrimination intersect to create um, unique dynamics and effects. So that's the term I'll use. Um, <clears throat> and so that intersectional identity really refers to traditionally marginalized groups, whereas social identities does not. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, and this is where more of my expertise and experience lies. So with that said, essentially folks with a complex intersectional identity may experience a more compounded reaction to reverse ageism or related acts of discrimination, whether those acts are intentional or through unconscious bias. So a person in the workforce may identify one, this is an example, as a cisgender woman, two, Asian, three, queer and out. So again, an example, discrimination or perceived discrimination that may stem from reverse ageism will be compounded by that person experiencing it. She's also part of three other marginalized groups. So to her, the discrimination being the reverse ageism, if she didn't have these other identities, she could be thinking, is this focused on me because I'm young? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm queer? Is it because I'm Asian or a combination or all of the above? And so, you know, she's going to feel that she's less desirable or able as a colleague in the situation where she's being treated inequitably. And whereas some people might just go, oh, it's because I'm young. There's like inter inner turmoil for this person with this complex identity. So my advice to an HR team on how to best support folks, not just in marginalized groups, but all like the entire workforce, all staff, so that everyone can thrive, um, this is very important because we don't want to put this on marginalized groups. We want it to be everyone. Um, HR should be working with senior leadership to set a foundation of a values-based inclusive work culture. So this is something I have a lot of energy on. I have notes to keep myself focused, but I'm happy for those of you who may not get your questions answered. If you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to speak further. So Initial steps towards this would be to begin implementing the following, a values-based interview and or exercise and the very first steps of the interview process, excuse me, interview process for any position, annual staff surveys and having all staff along with senior leadership, so this is existing staff, if you are going to roll this out, establish internal values that are tied to a performance management system and having ongoing trainings, perhaps during staff meetings or retreats that focus on unconscious bias, modes of communication, and the future of DEIA, DEIJ, which is really the evolution towards awareness around intersectionality. But that's just a start. 
the key here is for the HR team to get the senior leadership buy-in. So that's your VP, set your C-suite. We want them along with the HR team to be modeling and established establishing, excuse me, that values-based inclusive work culture. And we want that also to happen in the initial relationship building with any potential new employee. So it's not just like when someone starts their job, it's right at the beginning of the relationship when you meet them because you're managing expectations that way. You want that buy-in stage um, when you're establishing those internal values with all staff and senior leadership, because then these values around intersectionality, intersectional identity can later and continuously be explored and reinforced through those ongoing trainings that happen at staff meetings or retreats. And that awareness around complex identities will keep living and breathing through your values and that'll just become part of your culture. Great, thank you so much, Edie. Uh, next up, we'll go to you, Michael. Um, Michael, from your experience of training, how does unconscious bias or implicit bias play into ageism in the workplace? And are there specific tactics or resources that you recommend for employers to use when onboarding new staff? So um, let me preface by saying that traditional workplaces typically are um, constructed in hierarchy that prizes seniority. And the way that this typically um, happens is that older staff um, would be on top and younger workers uh, tend to be uh, on the bottom rung. And they're expected uh, to climb the ladder, so to speak. And certainly that's what I experienced as a young professional after I graduated from UC Davis. And certainly something that I still continue to experience um, as someone who has a little bit uh, uh, more years uh, under my belt. So when we think about um, um, how um, this can be um, facilitated in uh, in educational settings, so in uh, in trainings as part of professional development, I think it's important for um, for uh, employees across all generations to really explore in terms of what their added are. It's really informed by their experience within the workplace. And that's um, across uh, the various generations because it provides an opportunity for, um, for folks to address the pervasive perceptions, right? Um, across the generations and certainly um, have a way in uh, retraining our brains, right? In how we may uh, make the necessary corrections because there's these perceptions may be based on uh, the biases uh, that we have. Um, from my experience early in training, um, the their typical, um, what I would call coded language that folks use um, that very much speak to uh, differences in generation. I mean, they can be very, very positive and speaking about the younger generation. Uh, millennials and, and Gen Z, um, more positive words like ambitious, intelligent, tech savvy tend to be uh, really prominent um, identifiers in terms of how we describe uh, the younger generation. But I think it's also very, very interesting that when it comes to describing them, there tends to be a more negative slant, right? And words like entitled, uh, being coddled, disrespectful, radical, uh, typically are some words that have been used. Now, again, um, these uh, types of languages, uh, this type of language in, in terms of how we communicate about the differences um, has the danger in terms of how it can then um, uh, leak out in terms of practices and policies. And at the get-go, when we think about training, um, we have to focus on what we don't typically um, question as part of our everyday way of communicating that sends really, really powerful message that can then certainly lead to breaches in climate across the diversity of a workplace. And so the training here is essential, again, in building awareness and knowledge that hopefully will then translate to skill development, how we then navigate the reality of that diversity. So in, um, in um, creating strategies, and I think in particular onboarding. And this, what I find acro uh, uh, works across uh, different generations. I think it's very important to really be intentional 
in uh, letting folks know, irrespective of what generation you come from, these are the uh, ways that we work within this department and to make sure that there's clarity in terms of what the culture is in place. Um, these are the expectations. These are the ways that we, uh, that we uh, generate feedback. These are the ways that we address concerns. And also making sure that when there's an opportunity for you to create practices and policies that you're intentional and in actually including as many folks as much as possible that represent that workplace. So just imagine if you're always going to the folks who are who has the most seniority, has the most knowledge, that exclude folks in terms of the value that they can give as far as how do we become innovative, for example, moving forward that takes into account that, you know, our workplace does not look the same as it did 10 or 20 years ago. So I think being intentional and in who you include as part of practice making and policy making is really important. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Um, and before we get to Francesca, I'll mention that in just a few minutes, we'll begin addressing audience questions. Uh, so please uh, keep those questions coming in through the Q&A, and we'll get there in just a few minutes. Uh, so Francesca, tell us more about what motivated you to start the Young Professional Community at UCSB, and uh, tell us about the positive outcomes from this network. So I, like I said, I started my staff role right out of graduation and I was just finding myself feeling very isolated um, in my first staff role, just being the youngest one in my department. Um, and then I started attending campus meetings and joining committees and I started realizing like, wait, there's other young people here? Like, I'm not the only young person that works here? Like, wow, this is great. Um, so I started building like, you know, kind of little friendships along the way um, and just connecting with other young people on campus. and. We were like, what if we leverage the strength? Like, what if we not only, um, you know, found each other, but also welcomed and invited others um, who are feeling this way? Because we started having conversations and realizing we're not the only ones feeling this way. Um, it wasn't just me feeling like I was isolated in my department. It was everyone in their own department feeling very isolated. And so, um, you know, we're like, what if we made this a thing? Like, what if we band together, we start, um, Kind of connecting folks across campus, inviting people to hang out, not, not only for social events, but we started planning kind of professional development um, events and things that were tailored to young professionals, right? Because we're all like, yeah, we all know we should probably attend one of the UC retirement workshops to learn more about that. But like, I feel like it's going to be catered to somebody who's about to retire, right? No one wants to go to that. So we we're like, what if we got the UC retirement people to come out and give a workshop specifically for young professionals and how they can plan for retirement in a way that's digestible and relevant to them. Um, so then we started planning like professional development opportunities and also social events just so people could connect and find out, um, find other, other young professionals, other people with shared interests and just build a community on campus. So that was some of the like awesome outcomes that have come um, not only from leadership from the board. So all of our board members have gotten a lot of leadership experience. Um, but also our members have been able to connect with one another across campus, build community, um, and just find find their place and finally feel like they belong, just build that sense of belonging. Wow, well, that's really incredible work that you're doing. Sounds like uh, you're making a real difference on the campus. Thanks for that. Um, so we're going to go to a quick lightning round um, and then get to our Q&A. Um, and for this, just spend about 20 seconds answering um, are there any resources you recommend that we read, watch, or listen to? And uh, we'll start with you, Jessica. So my answer to this would actually be to reach out to the people around you. Um, so to some extent, building off what Francesca just said, like your coworkers are great resources for sharing experiences and getting support. Also those cross-generational differences. If we think about ageism as coming from people not seeing you as an individual, but seeing you in terms of, of one or more of your identities, like think about trying to, you know, to build those relationships with people around you so that people start to see you as you as an individual and what you're capable of. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, Evie. To expand on that further, kind of create community. So you can create community at work, with others that you um, want to share experiences with. You could join a lo local networking group for your industry um, or some other kind of identifier that you feel um, close 
too. And a lot of people say, oh, I don't have time for that, but prioritize yourself because work is a big part of your life. So that is a priority because that's affecting your work life, which is a big part of your life. And then this is a little bit lighter, but I recommend um, if you're interested, Dr. Han Ren on Instagram. She's a great um, speaker and um, expert talking about intersectional identity. She's not a workplace expert, but she's a psychology thought leader. That's Dr. Period, H-A-N, like Han Solo, period, R-E-N, Ren. Great. Thank you, Evie. How about you, Michael? Um, I think it's important to um, be familiar in terms of the uh, institution's policies in place that certainly have us understand um, discrimination as regards to age. And also uh, EEOC is a great resource in terms of how to understand uh, laws and policies that may guide us in how we may create uh, practices and uh, local policies that uh, don't run afoul uh, to, uh, to age discrimination. I mean, interestingly enough, in terms of how the law is written, uh, protection is for folks 40 and above. Um, and the notion of um, uh, ageism uh, for those who are younger than 40 uh, gets murky, uh, especially when it comes uh, when it comes up uh, in form of grievance. And that's where I think institutions like university fill in the gap in terms of what the law may not uh, readily, uh, readily address. So I think being very, very uh, clear and having a great understanding in terms of how laws and policies are in will help in how we may address um, these uh, instances when we know that age may come into play um, as a form of grievance or someone feeling um, excluded because of their age. Great. Thanks, Michael. And how about you, Francesca? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Uh, so just any uh, quick resources you would recommend uh, that folks uh, read, watch, or listen to? Honestly, if I find like Google articles really helpful, like when you just search up an, like an issue or something that's been happening to you specifically, I found that when I find articles of other people experiencing the same thing, that's really like comforting to know that someone else has been going through that same issue or same experience um, and finding out how other people have kind of handled it. Great. Thanks so much. All right, so we're now going to start our Q&A with the audience. Uh, we have a number of fantastic questions. Uh, the first one is for Evie. How do you communicate with someone who has uh, that to do whatever it takes attitude that we were discussing before? And how do you try to explain uh, the desire for a healthier and more sustainable approach to working? Um, this question is from Katie, and Katie mentions uh, that she uh, finds uh, this in her workplace, uh, something that she's trying to navigate. Uh, so tell us about this. Hi, Katie. Sure. So my answer, you know, I'm answering based on the information that I have. So if I'm communicating with like a team level colleague or a peer level, that's going to be different than if I'm um, communicating with a supervisor in this scenario. So I just want to say that and I'm, you know, happy to talk offline. Um, one of the things, um, because I could read the question too, is that this kind of hectic um, feeling of getting something done, no matter what it takes, can vary from industry to industry. There are different expectations for like me and nonprofit and philanthropy versus if I worked at Uber. So I want to say that too. Um, those are very different or academia. Um, but one of the things we talk about at my workplace and that I've been fortunate enough to have pretty much instilled in my last couple workplaces um, is the emotional intelligence and appealing through emotion because a lot of times appealing with logic allows the other person to just start arguing or saying, but this, but that. So if I could lead with like, you know, I'm feeling run down or like I want to have even greater success in my next projects. When I'm, you know, finishing something, what works for me is to do this rather than just pushing through, you know, and jumping on to the next thing. And so part of that is going to be how well you know this colleague. And so appealing to, you know, how they operate. I know that's not such a cut and dry answer, but it's pretty nuanced. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, thank you. And I'll clarify, I misspoke. Uh, that excellent question came from Monica. Uh, Monica, thank you so much for that question. 
Uh, next up is a question from Ilda uh, for Francesca. Uh, how do you deal with being perceived as a student during your transition out of undergrad? Um, Ilda mentions that she's currently having this problem um, and that one way that she, uh, she deals with it is by dressing business casual, uh, which is not the favorite approach because uh, older staff members can uh, wear whatever they want and uh, don't have to do that. So. Francesca, what advice do you have on, on this uh, situation? Yeah, I can relate completely to the person asking this question. Um, and I found myself in the same predicament um, where I where you always feel like you have to overcompensate um, in other ways to accommodate or to be perceived the way that you want to be perceived. And this translates to kind of, I think all other industries, I'm sure in other industries, um, people have, younger people have experienced maybe being perceived as an intern. Um, and so this has probably happened, yeah, across the board for folks. Um, and I definitely found myself overdressing as well um, to kind of assert my place um, or that I belong or that I was staff. Um, but another way that I could think of um, is really just kind of contradicting when someone like uh, assumes you're a student. So for example, like I work with students and a lot of times students think that I'm a student. Um, and rather than going to a place of like, oh, haha, -ha, like I thank you. I think I appreciate it. I look so young. I'd be like, oh, actually, no, when I was a student at UCSB. So just reframing what they say um, and changing the language. So when they're like, oh, so you're a student, right? So how did you do this? I'm like, well, when I was a student, I would do X, Y, Z. So really reframing what they say or rephrasing it um, in a way to assert the fact that you are not a student anymore and just being really confident with your language. Um, another thing that's really helped me is just seeking out a mentor, depending on your industry. Hopefully there's some kind of like built-in mentorship, but if not, finding a mentor um, can really help you with very specific scenarios like this one, um, just to bounce ideas off of. And I found that really helpful for me. Great, thank you, Francesca. Uh, the next question is from Uriel uh, for Jessica. And for today, we've discussed ageism primarily in the workplace, but it exists in other places too. How do you overcome the challenges in different spheres out in the world? Uh, one example that Uriel provides is um, a dentist seeing a young person may uh, believe that that person can handle more pain. Uh, just as an example. Uh, Jessica, what are your thoughts on ageism outside of the workplace? I mean, I would certainly acknowledge and agree that it's something that isn't exclusive to the workplace, right? So these, you know, seeing people in terms of their age and responding to people in terms of, of that is something that, that happens across different domains. It's not, it's certainly not exclusively something that happens at work. Um, I think somewhat similar to some of the things that Francesca actually just mentioned, um, you know, kind of being vocal and advocating for yourself, I think is a really important part of addressing ageism, no matter where, um, you know, sort of no matter where it's happening, whether that's in the dentist's office or at the workplace, or even in like a family situation, like a family gathering where you're being, you know, treated as the younger, the younger family member in a way that you don't appreciate, things like that. Um, you know, I don't, I think there are ways to do it politely, certainly like some of the reframing of questions like Francesca was suggesting, like you don't have to come out and aggressively contradict somebody and say, no, I'm not blah, 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 blah. But I think that asserting what it is you need. So in the case of a dentist, uh, it's like, um, you know, I'm really having some difficulty right now. Can you please, you know, help me with this? Um, but but also kind of challenging people's assumptions, whether that's directly or indirectly through, through your behavior, through the way that you act, through the way that you communicate. And if there is something problematic to, um, to address it in the conversation. Uh, one of the things we see you know, in the research on communication and, and ageism and aging, and it's not super surprising, but is that oftentimes people do these things without recognizing that they're being experienced as problematic. Like, I truly believe that a lot of people are well-intentioned, they're just being guided by stereotypes and they can have misguided stereotypes. Like they can have incorrect stereotypes about other people. And they may not recognize that the thing they're saying is being perceived as patronizing or being perceived as problematic. And honestly, if no one steps up and tells them, like if nobody asserts that, that it's a problem, they're never going to know and they're going to go on to the next interaction with somebody else and they're going to do the same thing. Um, and so although it can be challenging in the moment, I think we do need to, to kind of take that step of, 
of kind of putting a, a stop. And I think you can do it in like a gentle and, and you know, a, a conversationally appropriate way. Um, but letting people know when something isn't okay with you or isn't the case and, and kind of advocating for yourself in that way, I think is a really important thing to do. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, the next question is for Michael. How do you handle the imposter syndrome that comes along with being a young professional? It's a great question. So imposter syndrome is something that um, strikes me as a little uh, strange when people say it, because when we term it as syndrome, it's as if it's some kind of pathology or some kind of illness um, that uh, that folks have. I mean, I recognize um, the uh, the phenomenon, and so I actually prefer saying imposter phenomenon, which is something that we experience irrespective of what age. I mean, I think it's important to have an opportunity to actually address where the feelings are coming from. And as someone who is an employer, for example, I think it's important to acknowledge that it is something that everyone goes through and provide an opportunity in terms of here are the supports that are available to you. Now, as a young professional, I mean, certainly I experienced this in terms of what it means to fake it until I make it. I think it's very important to be forthcoming in terms of the questions that I have, the answers that I need, and frame that in terms of I want to be able, I want to be, I want to be successful in doing this, this, this work. And these are the questions that I have as part of my learning. All of us have a learning curve. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, something that um, anyone in the workforce can experience irrespective of what, what age you are. I mean, especially if you're joining a new organization, there needs to be a time for you to really learn in terms of how things operate. So inquiring about what are the opportunities available to me to learn about these things and to have, to have my questions answered. And how can I make sure that I receive the feedback that I'm looking for to make sure that I'm on the path of doing the work in the way that is expected um, of me to have the work done. So those are some, some suggestions um, when we are feeling that certainly uh, uh, we're experiencing the um, impost, uh, imposter phenomenon. Great, thank you so much, Michael. And we have time for one more audience question that we have, um, but before I read it, I'll mention, uh, I know a lot of other folks who have questions too. Uh, definitely reach out to our esteemed panelists on LinkedIn or any other way uh, to ask uh, your questions there and continue the conversation as well. Um, so this last question we'll get to is for the women of the panel. Uh, what differences in ageism related to gender do you see? Um, so anyone who would like to answer that. Will you ask the question one more time? I want to make sure I... Yes. Okay. Um, so it's what differences in ageism related to gender do you see? Well, I'm an introvert processor, so I gave a lot of thought to the questions I was addressing today. So I'm just going to use myself as an example. Um, <clears throat> I'm almost 40, and people often ask me if I go to UCSB, which in a way is flattering, but, you know, I've been working for a long time, so I've had so many different work experiences prior to getting into human resources. Getting into human resources, in a way, was a result of such varied work history and a lot of experience with blatant discrimination. I wasn't necessarily just thinking that it was um, age-based, but all of that to say, you know, it was many layers. Um, I think um, what I've seen, and I'm not going off of data, Jessica, you got, you have data, um, a younger woman who is in a higher level role or in charge of a situation, it kind of seems to be like, oh, you know, that's a one-off, or I've been perceived as someone's assistant when I've been an executive, um, and when it's a younger man, it's more, oh, you know, he's, you know, what a whippersnapper, you know, he, he did all the right things to get here. So that's just kind of my experience talking to, from me more than me as the HR person. Thank you so much, Evie. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on this question? I would just, I'll oh, oh, go ahead, Francesca. Um, I wasn't going to call it, I wouldn't say I've experienced like blatant discrimination, but I just think it's just different life stages that we're in when we compare ourselves to our colleagues. 
um you know a lot of the times I'm like the only one who's just kind of like off on my own and a lot of my colleagues have families and it just feels like a lot of times like work events and things like that are catered to people with families people with kids um and then there's just me just kind of off on my own and it just it just feels a little isolating but I wouldn't call it discrimination it's just like we're in different life stages and it's just something that people aren't often aware of when they're like oh bring your family to xyz I'm like all right cool <laughs> you know so that's just like a difference that I've experienced I was just going to add on very briefly to to what Evie was saying that I do think there are different stereotypes associated with like men and women in the workplace and this this go connects back to things she was saying earlier and those those are going to intersect with age and when we think about like what are our stereotypes of like what is a you know a prototypical young man or a prototypical young woman and what do we expect of those people um, and how do we expect people, you know, of those different genders to behave and, you know, how do we respond to those behaviors? Um, I think there are differences there. Um, and I think that also extends to older adulthood too, our ideas of what a prototypical older woman and an older man are like and what kind of behaviors are like positive or acceptable or things like that. Like people have different ideas about this, this connection between kind of age and gender. Um, and so I do, you know, I just, I guess, want to acknowledge that I, I do think that men and women are going to experience this differently. Um, that's not to say that one necessarily experience, like I haven't seen anything concrete that would suggest that across the board, there is necessarily more or less of X, but just acknowledging that those differences in stereotypes that we have uh, in terms of gender and age and how they intersect, I think do lead people to experience ageism differently um, by gender. Got it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful panel. We're at the end of our time. Uh, but on behalf of the University of California, thank you for joining us today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It was a pleasure to connect virtually with each of you today. Um, we appreciate making the time to be a part of today's event and hope that you've gained valuable insights and strategies into making career and life pivots. I know I have. Um, I'd like to thank Jessica, Francesca, Michael, and Evie for their time, their generosity, and their commitment to the University of California. The insights and advice that you each shared today uh, make me especially proud to be part of the UC community. I hope you will take a few minutes to provide feedback on today's event uh, by following the survey link which appeared in your browser when you launched today's webinar. The feedback that you provide will help improve this series and help the organizers select topics for upcoming sessions. Please visit ucal.us forward slash ACN for recordings of the past webinars. And the recording of this webinar will be posted in the near future. Thank you all again so much for joining us today um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.